Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to Think Games Istanbul. Now, as we begin, I wanted to do four, four key thanks. So, I want to first thank everybody here and everybody online for coming to the event, for viewing the event, and for being present and for being online. So, thank you. Secondly, I want to thank the speakers. So, we have speakers all the way from San Francisco to Singapore, from Barcelona to Beijing. And I want to thank all of the speakers that came in here to share their insights about product, about marketing, about the market, and about funding. So I hope you enjoy all the talks. Thirdly, of course, I want to thank Google. Without Google, this wasn't possible. And I want to especially thank Google because they're always supporting the ecosystems, whether it's downtime, whether it's the high time. Uh, they do amazing events. They bring people together. And that is the most important part of, of us, of the gaming industry. And fourth, I want to give a, a special MVP thanks to Sime Karaj from Google. She's been absolutely essential in, in making this happen. Everybody who's a speaker, everybody who's been organizing, she's been the one in contact with, with everyone. So uh, she's been the, uh, the key glue and the MVP player of this event. So Sime is uh, fantastic. Yeah, I want to reiterate that for Sime is absolutely amazing. She's like uh, wrangling cats to get us all together on this. Um, and what I would say is that uh, she's far more fun after the event than during the event. So <laughs> give her a fist bump, elbow something, say hello, and, get, and give her thanks. Um, the other thing I wanted to say before we get started is a public service announcement. announcement. So things suck in gaming, just generally speaking, right? It's a pretty awful time in general. And what I realized after thinking about this is the majority of people that have worked in mobile have never seen a downturn, right? Because mobile really started taking off in 2010. So we have, it's been a while. I've been personally through two and a half, right? In 94, when I started working, it was freaking terrible market. In 2000, it was absolutely brutal. And then in 08. So this is normal, sort of, right? And it sounds a little flippant, but this is what happens. It boom and bust cycles and we readjust and everything will be fine. Um, in 2001, for instance, I was in my parents' basement playing EverQuest for over a year looking for work until EA took me back. Right? <laughs> so it gets better, it will be better, and, um, and just hang in there. All right? You're, don't go off and start looking to be a plumber or something. <laughs> Gaming will be fine, mobile is huge, console is massive, we'll all be okay. All right, so in this presentation, we're going to talk about a lot of the pr predictions. And by a lot, I mean six different ones. And it would be weird to talk about predictions if we didn't go through the previous predictions that we did last year. So just to run quickly through the uh, last year's eight predictions and how we did to maybe get a little bit of a credibility of what we're going to say today. So number one, we predicted that organic discovery will be dead and buried. And yes, featuring has been a memory of the past for a while. The K factors are pretty much at their all-time low, and even indies were admitting last year that featuring is kind of dead. So on to the next one, streaming platforms. This was a prediction that as Netflix was pouring billions into gaming, that would force other streaming platforms to really seek for publishing um, in gaming and then really looking at gaming as a growth avenue. That did not happen, so we were wrong. We said that you would most likely be returning to office. Well, things changed in 2023. The power shifted from the employee back to the employers, and employers started to enforcing the type of uh, structure and the company cultures that they f feel that fit them best versus what are the best for individuals. And we saw a lot of return to office. Not all the companies, but many companies did this. Uh, we predicted that you might be getting laid off, and unfortunately, that prediction came true. Gaming was not recession-proof, as was thought before the down market downturn. There was a lot of overhiring during the lockdowns, as the world was perceived to be a very different place than it was right now. Metaverse did not come, zero interest rates disappeared, and growth stalled. And because of that, we're seeing a correction, and we arguably can be seeing even an overcorrection through 2024. We predicted that it, developers would go to the safe harbors, the Apple arcades, the Netflix games, somebody who would pay them in advance for a game so that they can live to fight another, time, another day. And with privacy changes, economic downturn, the VC winter, that came true. A lot of developers were seeking money from these um, platforms 
to get paid to, you know, to ship a game. We also predicted that it would be a, a reckoning for the VCs. Um, and we saw a lot of venture capital pull away from gr growth stage investing. In terms of dollar amounts, we saw the investments go down 75%. At the same time, the amount of investments went down by about 25%. So there was, there was less checks and the checks were much smaller. And what was happening and what will be likely happening is some of the companies will go down or take down rounds during this next year. We also predicted that the web shops would be embraced by the publishers. And that came to true. Payments are not as complicated as they once were. There were pl plenty of service providers, more coming in almost every day. Um, this allows a lot of publishers to avoid the platform premiums, and it also allows them to own their customer relationships. So we saw a big shift in this direction. And finally, something that uh, actually Eric is going to talk about more today is that paid user acquisition became more of a break-even game. So downloads were decreasing in many key markets. Most advertisers were struggling to break even or to reach the same type of a heights. And there were some companies that were able to succeed despite the IDFA. We have some of the talks like Scopely is going to be here today talking about Monopoly Go. So it's not all bad for everybody, but it was bad for many. So you can argue that we were more right than wrong, I suppose, yeah. this last year. So we'll see about this year. So moving on to predictions uh, for the DMA. Now, clearly, I'm no expert on the DMA. Mr. Archie out there was trying to school me last night. So <laughs> I'm not going to pretend, right? But what I'll say is clearly the idea behind DMA is to give publishers more control over their stores and to allow them to have a more direct relationship with their customer in, in theory. Um, Apple's proposal was clearly not acceptable. Um, so there's 17%, 3% processing fee. This core technology runtime fee was obviously not a great idea. Um, the Apple store, like with this absolutely insane uh, scare screen is, is not acceptable. And then the big thing is that one decision is basically for the entire organization, which won't work as well. So this is Apple at its finest, right? And I talk about this on the podcast all the time. It's like heads you lose, tails I win type thing. And you got to respect, you know, how deviously clever they are in terms of abiding by the idea, of, uh, sorry, abiding by the letter of the law, but clearly not the spirit of the law in terms of what uh, they were supposed to do. So, again, these type of policies or regulation that uh, capture for the big, you know, only the big companies are going to be able to do these type of activities. Epic and Microsoft are already making moves. Epic, evidently, yet today, just got their store pulled, so there, there goes that. But nonetheless, they are likely coming back to the store this year, regardless, is what I'm hearing anyway. So I imagine most publishers will opt out of this, and it'll be kind of a steady, the same thing as ever. Um, but my prediction here is that I think DMA is going to go medieval on them, right? And we'll find out actually this week, at least the initial things. But over the year, I think they're just going to go after Apple. And because my understanding is that DMA is not to be trifled with. And, and, and I think they're going to get super aggressive with Apple. And they're going to start to feel the heat um, as soon as it starts to be implemented. And we should see fines and additional uh, legislation to force them back to the uh, table to, to, to negotiate this. So that's my first prediction. OK. All right. I'll try to do a, a little bit of a difficult one prediction. So the lean times will drag on. Now, what happened in 2023 is we didn't see much growth in the game market overall almost the same size, and when you adjust that to inflation, it was actually a decrease in the market size. And when you break it down to the three key market areas, you see PC, that was actually the one market that was growing, and of course, there was a lot of great games that were launched on PC and console, and there's a lot of innovative games that were launched on, on PC, and there are some several key franchises that were doing really well, so some live op franchises like the uh, League of Legends or the um, Counter-Strikes, they were doing well and actually growing throughout the year. On the console side, if you can go back, please. <laughs> On the console side, what was happening is the growth that was expected due to the uh, amazing, I mean, probably one of the best years in the industry ever was 2023 in terms of quality of games. Yet, when we look at the console market as a whole, we merely see um, a growth on that. And it seems like there's not enough users and there's too many different games, but there's also too many different business models happening at the same time when you have subscription games with a whole huge catalog. You have 
fantastic premium games coming out. And then you have games as a service like Fortnite and Roblox came in on the console. So all these things combined together with the hard accessibility of the platform, with the expensive price, and with a very limited amount of audience made, made it so that the platform did not, or the, or the revenues did not grow despite the, uh, the expectations of, and the quality of the games launched. And then we have our own, mobile. 50% usually of the industry, now a little bit lower. We actually saw, according to the new zoo, we saw a little bit of a decline. And of course, this is a lot due to the, uh, the privacy changes. But there are other things that affected the sort of a, I wouldn't say decline, but this lack of growth in our industry. And those are pretty much five trends that are affecting. So number one is, of course, we had the lockdown years. We had the 21, 22, although bad for majority of people, very good for our industry. What changed was people started to travel more. They started doing different fitness activities. They started dating. They started going to the restaurants. They started moving around, being less at home, being less at their screen. Number two was a structural shift in privacy that, of course, shaked the game economy, meaning the UA arbitrage game days were over. Number three, we had competition from other media sources. So that was always there, but it seems like users spent more and more time on social media, more time on, on streaming, and again, the dating, I don't know why I keep talking about dating apps, I don't, I don't use them, but, but music and, and podcasts and products and all of those were taking more and more time and being more engaging than, than perhaps games before. Then we had different geopolitical, not had, we are still having many geopolitical crises, and that of course, made the world from a globalized to a multipolar. And finally, there were a lot of economical challenges that impacted spending. More concretely, it was interest rates, and then there was inflation. So first comes inflation, then comes the interest rates. And that's really something that I wanted to dive deep into, because I don't think I can speak to many things. You will speak about the other UA stuff. And to make my point, what I'm trying to say here is, the interest rates will have, the high interest rates will have an impact on the lack of growth of the industry. And as long as we have higher interest rates, we won't be seeing the, the type of uh, growth that we had before. And to make my case, I'll take you back to the 70s. And during the 70s, it was um, arguably the worst time since the Great Depression for most developed economies. And that was because of, because of well, war. The war in the Middle East caused the the price of oil to go up, and the price of oil that went up, the inflation went up. And when the inflation went up, central banks increased the interest rates. That's all normal. But what was happening in the 70s, every time they brought down the interest rates, the inflation went, went up again higher and higher. Now, the people in charge of central banks lived through this, so they know this very well. And my argument is, and listening to the central banks, what they're saying is that even as the inflation will go down to the normal level, to 2%, whatever, they will not change the interest rates because they're afraid that it will bounce back. So they will keep it longer. They want to see, uh, they, they want to truly kill the inflation. And that's why I believe that the interest rates will remain high. Now, what that means is, is that there are severe effects to different types of companies. I'm using Embracer just as an example, but it's really for all the companies that were focusing more on growth rather than profitability. So, with the highest, higher interest rates, what that means basically is that the cost of servicing debt goes up. The more debt you have, the more expensive it is. If you have a lot of debt, like some companies that have been very much focused on growth, that means that you have a significant financial strain on your business, meaning that even the day-to-day -day operations become very expensive and you have to cut costs. So there will be a decline of mergers and acquisitions. You can't take money from the bank in order to buy new companies. It's... Um, if you can, one slide back. Right. Uh, you can't, it's, it's hard to take M&A, it's hard to take the investment, put in the investments into new products. You're becoming more risk averse. You're thinking about franchises and IPs rather than thinking about new cool games because, because it's just so expensive and you don't have any more the money to invest into riskier bets. At the same time, there's a rise in productivity. Your day-to-day -day operations are more expensive, so you're pushing productivity, you're pushing efficiency, and that leads as we can have seen, to a lot of layoffs. So, to summarize it, I believe that high interest rates are one of the key elements that influence the lean times in games. There's a few things. So, limited consumer demand for games. Interest rates also hurts consumers, and they have to prioritize where they spend their money. We can see that in console market, where so many great games launched, and still we didn't see the same type of a growth as expected. 
we'll see fewer games in development because it's just too expensive to invest and companies are avoiding a lot of riskier bets. We'll see uh, fewer investments into new projects or new studios. Um, there will be few exits through mergers and acquisitions. And of course, this is an important part not only for the founders, but it's also an important part for the VCs. When there's no exits, it's more dangerous to, to invest and so forth. Uh, there's going to be focus on pro profitability instead of growth. And finally, there's going to be focus on efficiency and productivity. And those will continue to lead to layoffs as I believe the, uh, the market will be overcorrecting itself. But then again, when you overcorrect, at some point you go to a different direction. And as Chris said, there's booms and busts. And unfortunately, we're going through uh, one of the, uh, the latter one. I didn't know that Mishka was an economist. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm going to bring it back to this chart that I used last year, which is a complete eyesore. I know and McKinsey consultants are eyes are bleeding at this point. But the, the line here is the market growth for revenue in the U.S. And then the green bars are basically the growth. And what we saw was actually things got started to improve. And they're actually much better in Q1 this year as well. Um, so we're seeing some kind of stabilization, I, I would say, in, in the UA market as people kind of adjust to the new world order. Um, now, I think it's driven a lot by Facebook, AppLevin, and Google, which kind of have, have adjusted really well. to the, And then to some degree, uh, you know, Unity is limping along with the rest of them. But, um, but also we saw absolutely massive re release with Monopoly Go and the further success of the, of the puzzle genre or the match uh, genre. Um, in this next chart, uh, basically what I'm trying to show here is exactly kind of what I said last year, is that the, the, the casual game genres are doing extremely well and, and driving the majority of the growth, while all the core genres are still deteriorating, kind of as expected without targeting. Um, I think this will actually continue for the next couple of years. Um, and then the, this final chart is another eyesore, but... The fundamental thing here is that this is, continues to be a battle of the big, right? So what this chart is basically saying is that 64% of the revenue generated last year are games that are five years or older, right? So even with the success of Monopoly Go, which you can see it jumped at the new releases from 3 to 7%, still the majority of the gaming is being done by the big publishers and the big games. Um, and again, this is a battle of the big with, with huge budgets, making huge UA event, uh, bets like... Uh, Monopoly Go, which is profitable, by the way. Um, so <laughs> anyway, so my prediction is that we are going to see some stabilization in the UA market. Um, Facebook and AppLovin are, are leading the charge, as well as Google. Uh, Unity is, you know, the two drunks holding each other up are limping along. Um, we'll see if they can pull it together. Um, the market, I think, will remain flattish over the next few years, which is a little bit better than what I expected last year. Um, and I'll get to that why in a minute. Uh, and, and again, continually suffering for the core, but to the, with casual kind of leading the charge. So what about fingerprinting? So last year I was expecting fingerprinting to get more, be, uh, Apple to be more aggressive on fingerprinting. And I think I'm going to say I was wrong on that. I think at this stage they are going to allow uh, IP tracking as a way, uh, as an alternative to uh, IDFA. Um, now I could be wrong and then in a few months I'll be... <laughs> I have to repeat this, this uh, presentation, but there's a couple reasons why I think this is going to happen. One is they don't have the capability of actually doing it. Um, two is uh, they do not want to impact their ecosystem as much. The reality of it is Apple's not doing all that well, right? This disastrous visor launch, you know, the Vision Pro looks like an absolute train wreck. They got rid of the uh, car. So it's like they don't have any avenues of growth, and so they cannot go after their cash cow um, by implementing these changes because these changes don't only impact gaming, but it imp impacts the entire ecosystem. So my, the expectations, the expectation that people I talk to is they will not go, uh, go um, after uh, fingerprinting. And the result, Google Android will obviously be the most private, and, uh, private network in, all, in the world for, for, uh, for mobile, right? Go Google. All right. Interesting. So apps will overtake games in terms of revenue. I wrote a little bit about this topic, and it was one of the most divisive writings that I've done. Some people liked it, some people hate it. And I, I like to mine a little bit for conflict. I like to say certain things, show some data, and wait for others to prove it wrong. If they prove it wrong, I'll change my opinion. Now, in terms of games and apps, there's some interesting graphs that I want to go through. So as you can see from here, you have the, uh, the consumer spend 
and you have the, uh, the growth of income. What we can see in 21 what's happened is that the uh, consumer spend went down both for apps and games. It rebounds really quickly for apps and continued to go up and continues to go up at a significant pace. And this is of course in-app purchase revenue. It is not in-app ad revenue. It is not web shop revenue. Only in-app purchases, which is the main thing that really matters for platform holders. Now, when we look at the, um, and even the growth, by the way, of, of disposable income did not rebound the, uh, the spending on in-app purchases. So looking at the next couple of graphs, when we look at the market, and the market wasn't really growing that much, so everything was, was stable during the last few quarters. And during the last few quarters, the apps were taking more and more of consumer spend compared to games. We still like to refer that games make 75% of App Store revenue. They might be making even more of that because of all the in-app ads, because of the web shops. If, we continue, if you count that way, yes. But if we only look at from the platform side, what we're seeing is that apps are the ones that are drawing growth of revenue. And we as gamers, we like to point out to these graphs of, of saying like, you know, entertainment cost per hour is lowest at games. But is it truly? Like, if we really bring in all the apps, the YouTubes, the Twitters, the, uh, the TikToks, the Instagrams, those are pretty cheap. They take a lot of our time and, you know, they don't take a lot of our money. And then on the other hand, we also don't talk a lot about the utility. Many of these apps, with, as I said, the YouTubes, the TikToks are really important. The LinkedIn's, those are really important for, for many users. So even though if the uh, price could be a little bit of a higher, like Netflix over here, you have to also divide that to the whole family, for example. So the, the only looking at the cost per hour per entertainment is not the single metric that I believe the consumers are, are looking at when they're making their decisions where to spend their money, and most importantly, where to spend their time. And talking about these two things, money and time, I think there's two fronts that the apps are pushing games on, on mobile. Number one is, of course, the disposable income. When the disposable income decreases, it seems like, based on the graph that we're seeing, without actually knowing the web shop revenues, without knowing the in-app ad revenues, based only on those, it seems like the consumer spending and in-app purchases is, is, a, is not very flexible when it comes to apps and very flexible when it comes to in-app purchases. But most importantly, it's the time. Users are spending more and more time on different platforms. We like to say that our games are very social. They're addictive, they're this and that. But are we more social and addictive than, than the TikToks and the YouTubes and the, and the LinkedIn's? I'd argue, not so much. So time is, is very crucial, and it's not only with mobile gaming, and it's also, also what we're seeing in console uh, as an example. So the question kind of comes back to is, how do we take the road back to growth? And I think my perception from this, in, a, in operating in a very mature market compared to a growth market, you have to switch your approach from a lean startup, where you just throw out MVPs and figure things out to a more of a deliberate approach. And that really leads to a three things that I think the studios need to consider. So, so first of all is the sort of rapid experimentation where you do quick demos and you test them quickly and you find the fun and that is the game that you're going to develop. I think that's not enough anymore. I'm not saying that that's not a crucial part of your development process. It is. But I think you need to have a compelling strategy for what you are building. This is a mature market. You have, to you have to have insights. You have to have capabilities. You have to understand your competitors. You have to understand your market. You have to understand what is your funding situation. How much resources do you need in order to realize? You can't just have a quick demo and just go with it and, and believe that everything is going to happen today as it happened in 2013 or 16. You also, in my opinion, have to move away from fail fast and pivot approach to adjusting according to the strategy. So as you've set your strategy based on your insight, based on your capabilities, based on what's happening in the market and the funding you have and the funding you know you will get, you adjust inside of that. This morning we were talking with, um, with Jamie from, from Scopely and he was talking about the development process of Monopoly Go that it took seven years and there were major adjustments during that time. There were adjustments inside that strategy that was set by the company. And I think that is a, you know, a, a powerful version, of course, a very outlining type of a game. But I think you can do that for other ways as well. Keep your vision, your, your product placement, adjust inside of that, move forward. Don't pivot to something you don't know because it feels easier in the, uh, when, when you're doing the pivot. The th third part is 
over focusing on testing. We love that. We love to do something quickly, get it to users' hand, and then modify it based on how they're using it. That's, that's important, and I think you should be always testing different components of your game, of your marketing strategy as you progress in development cycle. At the same time, if you over focus on testing, you will get iter iterative title. And iterative titles are having a very hard time in this market. Now, it could be faster to build, but it's going to be very hard to market. The prices are going to be outlandishly expensive as you're competing you know, against the dozen other puzzle games uh, in the market. And I think, you know, Turkey in, in some sense, when I look at the market, a lot of you are making great puzzle games, but a lot of you are making great puzzle games. And, and that's, a, that's a bit of a challenge here. And then final part is, if you build it, they won't come. Like, that's not the approach that you have. You can't just build a game and say, okay, marketing, it's done. We've user tested, users love it, KPIs are great at a small scale, let's go. Too late. You have to have it from the beginning. You have to think about growth from the start of your game. You, even if you're a founder, when you go out pitching, that's what, what VCs will ask you. Well, what's your growth strategy? You can't just focus on the product and hope they will come. So that will be the change of the mindset, in my opinion, that could take you back to the growth. Hey, how do we get back there? We're going backwards. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my bad. All right. Uh, the, uh, investment predictions. So M&A. Um, so thanks to Convoy for these charts, by the way. Um, I think the market should see a slow increase. We, we actually saw some decent volumes in M&A um, last year, but I think this should increase because as companies run out of funding, they need alternative uh, ways of, uh, of, of alternatives, these strategic alternatives, and M&A is where they would go. Um, I do not expect, expect any mega mergers out there. Sorry, Mr. Goldman Sachs, if you're out there. Um, EA or Take-Two are likely not for sale this year. Um, Primarily kind of related to regulatory issues. I think it's really, really challenging with the current FTC, EU, and, and the UK bodies. Um, now, of course, if we have a new president in the uh, new president next year, heaven forbid, um, that could actually change, and that you know maybe they'll the FTC will start to uh, not hate big tech the way they do. Um, I do think that Ubisoft might be taken off out the, uh, off the board. Um, I don't think Eve is up to the challenge of, of managing that organization, as I've said many times in the podcast, um, but I think that's likely in 2025. Um, the fundamental problem that we have right now is that there are very few acquirers left, if you think about it, right? Zynga is off the board. Um, EA is licking their wounds from one of the worst acquisitions in video game history with uh, Glue. Scopely, I would imagine, is taking a break, but I guess, you know, we'll see, right? I mean, the Saudis are trying to figure out what to do with the asset, and, and, and uh, it's unclear as to what their strategy might be. Um, and then, obviously, Embracer and Skill, Stillfront are absolutely collapsed, um, so I don't know if they're going to be acquiring anything anytime soon. So there's just not a lot of buyers left. What I do think is that will lead to like likely lower valuations and more very, very selective acquisitions out there, and maybe some newer companies will come up as consolidators, something like Fortis, Tilting Point, you know, they have to be relatively well-funded, of course, um, to further consolidate the industry on the, on the smaller side. So that's kind of where I think the M&A market's going to be. The VC market, <laughs> it's going to be a slog. I think uh, the, the reality of it is, is that without platforms that grow the market, VCs become far and far less interesting. If you are in a flatline uh, type of market, VCs are going to go elsewhere. You know, likely chase the rainbow of AI um, and even crypto maybe to some degree because that's coming back, which is frightening. Um, but I think... You know, I think, again, the VCs are likely to go outside of gaming uh, and, and maybe, you know, again, go after AI. But, um, and whatever else comes up that, 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 you know, gets them excited. You know, I talked to these guys last night about it. Just, anyway, they're an interesting breed. Um, so I think we'll still can see, see these absolutely ludicrous investments by these, by these big VCs, like the, with these AAA projects, which, in my view, make absolutely no sense because... That's not a VC investment. You know, the, 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 the returns required for VC investment makes sense are 10x plus, right? So these 50, 30, 50 million dollar deals really make no sense. These deals are, are, are 
primarily geared towards publishers. This is what a publishing deal looks like, and VCs should not be publishers, just to be clear on this. So we should see those things continue, but they make no sense in my view. Um, and so I think this is kind of the biggest challenge with gaming as a whole, is that uh, we should see early stage funding continue, but this, this growth stage funding is going to be a real challenge, right, to find the, the bigger checks to get them to the next level of growth. Um, and so a lot of these companies will likely have to uh, uh, fail to scale and then likely get shut down or acquired. Um, but I, I do think that, that the, the early stage will still, as, as we, we, we adjust to the new world order, um, the early stage companies will go, like uh, our own Gorkum from uh, Google, he started Latent Ventures or Latin, whatever the fuck you pronounce it. <laughs> Sorry, I cursed. I'm not supposed to. But uh, late ventures, I think those type of funds that are actually going after early stage companies that are trying to adjust to the new world order, I think those will create the new crop of game companies that will be in you know three to four years. You can get those kind of returns. So I think that kind of investment will continue. Um, finally, for the public markets, um, so we've seen a lot of big players get taken off the board. So uh, and particularly Activision and Zynga, which hurts my business, um, but. Uh, but we actually, I do expect Epic to actually get to the public markets in the next 18 to 24 months. Um, as, as soon as the mar IPO market opens up, hopefully later in the year. We'll see, the fundamental problem here is that, if there's anybody from Epic, I apologize ahead of time, is that Tim Sweeney is, is not the right type of CEO, right? He's not going to be giving up much control to the public markets. And so it's a little dangerous, similar to like the Roblox CEO. Um, you know, he's a wild, uh, he, he, yeah, he's a liability to some degree, but, but, but we'll see. Um, I think that uh, will be big, a big, big IPO when that comes out. Um, but in the new world order and the way the, way the world is working right now with the mar markets kind of flatlined, it's a battle of the big, right? It's a ba market share game, right? And it's kind of back to the old ways before mobile where it's the winners and losers and you make bets. And in a hedge fund, for instance, you're betting long short. And so whoever actually wins the product cycle you know, the stock rises. And so it's, it is a good opportunity for the public markets. Um, and, and that's actually one of the reasons I'm starting a hedge fund next year. But if you have any questions, <laughs> let me know. But um, so uh, I think, you know, the public markets will be pretty active, generally speaking, uh, over the next few years. All right, last one. So AI. Al Bogut is actually going to be talking from Google about AI more. And we have more speakers actually showing what they're going to do with AI and, and, and actually puzzle game content. So interested in talks about AI. So I'm going to kind of zoom out and, and talk about it on a higher level. Now, the promise of AI for gaming is really twofold. First of all, if you have a smaller team and you're making unique creative games, now the resources, you're not held back as much by your resources if you embrace the, uh, the, the tools, the AI tools that you can use. On the other hand, if you have a large team, now you can make a truly open world, populated, procedurally developed content, adaptable game mechanics and narratives, truly immersive open worlds. Looking at elements like graphics and, and narrative design, we can see that with AI tools, you can enhance visuals by turning 3D rendered graphics into photorealistic images. So imagine playing a movie, something that has been promised in gaming for a long time. Uh, you can be exponentially faster at content creation. Talking to many studios, they went from testing a couple of different variants to testing tens of variants in the same amount or even shorter amount of time. Uh, there are deep learning systems in AIs that will contribute to a more visually appealing game environments. And finally, when we're talking about narrative designs and immersive games, AI can assist in crafting those compelling narratives. It can generate different plot twists, dialogues, and even branching storylines. Then looking at the, the programming side of things, you, ha you can basically revolutionize the game engines. So there's automations of various components, such as physics, graphics, rendering. Uh, there's procedurally generated game content, including levels, missions, characters. All of those will be procedurally generated. And then finally, there's analysis of players' behaviors during the gameplay that changes the preferences, based on the preferences of the player and evolves the gameplay. So adaptive game mechanics, adapting difficulty levels uh, according to the content that the AI actually procedurally generates. And kind of looking back and then thinking it more on the individual level. So I 
try to think of, of like what do we as individuals need to have to to embrace the change and those that are needed in the future world. And I'm not going to go through what is needed, but what's interesting is not what is not here. So there's nothing on problem solving. Quality control, attention to detail, and most importantly, working with others. So teamwork, leadership, social influence, empathy, active listening, all of these are missing here. And um, interesting take, of course, I'm not 100% in line with the World Economic Forum, I would say that, um, but definitely the other uh, things to focus on are quite different today as they were just a while back before the AI started taking over. And, you know, layoffs is in the news every single week. And there's been a lot of different types of articles that have been coming in from AI-related content. So if you just click through some of the, uh, the most fear-mongering articles that I could find, good sir. So... Essentially, whether it's the IMF, whether it's a Goldman Sachs, whether it is, just click on ahead, whether it is uh, Goldman Sachs, whether it is um, other institutions, whether it is um, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, your favorite McKinsey, all, or even NVIDIA, all of them are talking about the, the significant changes that AI will impact in all the, the workforces, not, not only just you know, gaming specific. And actually there's an anecdote. So when I came in here in, in Turkey on, on, to, on Tuesday, so the, um, the, uh, the receptionist was taking me to the hotel room, went to um, elevator in the evening and he's like, you know, <laughs> starting a conversation like, do you use chat GPT? I was like, yeah. And then he was like, listen, like he started using chat GPT and the tasks that took him two hours before, so writing different emails to, to clients and different type of tasks, now take two minutes or 10 minutes. And then he was saying how he's going to teach his daughter to, to start using AI to proactively you know, learn new, different things. And this is you know, prompted by, by another person. I wasn't asking him about AI. And what I'm trying to say is like how, how, a, how people are adapting to AI, not in, in, in our industry, but everywhere. How are they seeing the power of it? And I think those on the forefront are the uh, are the ones who are going to be who are going to evolve how we use how we use AI. So, um, anyways, just going back to this. So, transforming the way we make games. So, first of all, compact teams. Uh, there's a lot of amazing like PC is the uh, probably the most innovative market at the moment. And if you can imagine those small teams that are making games like Valheim or um, Battlebit and so forth, now with the with an extra tools of the tools of an AI, they can make bigger games. Maybe they can start operating those games. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities for smaller teams who previously lacked resources to make bigger, more creative titles. At the same time, for the large teams, it's an ability to make truly immersive worlds. Now, I believe that, that the people who are experienced professionals in the industry and who embrace AI can be invaluable assets in any company. Now, if you consider that, that superstar artist that you have in your studio, that amazing programmer, um, that, that great product manager or data analyst or, or you know, even a person in your finance or, or marketing departments. With AI tools, they can do much more. They can do much more faster. They can do things that they weren't able just to do before and you know, increase, I don't know, it's a word thing to say for about human to increase their value, but increase their contribution to, to the company and become truly invaluable players. At the same time, if you're less experienced, and or reluctant to start using these different AI tools, then it's going to be a, a challenge because these are transforming the ways we work. And if you don't want to use the new tools, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge that a lot of executives, of, of course, are, are wrestling with because we understand that adopting these tools will mean transformation. And we as people don't like transformation. We like things to be as it is. We don't want to see our our colleagues to be laid off, and, and especially if it's because of different type of tools. So there's natural inclination not to adopt these tools, but I think it's, um, I think, you know, in the long run, it's, it's impossible to, to keep this change away. So going back on a personal level, I think it is important to, to focus on creative thinking. Like data, like AI does not take your creativity away, and I think that is one of the most important part we have as humans. Analytical thinking, I mean, a lot of results from, from AI are, are quite BS, so you have to be able to cipher what is, what is true and what isn't. 
technological literacy, so meaning that you understand how these different tools work, but you also can embrace different type of tools and then try them out. And I think this is always important, lifelong learning, resilience, probably every, that what people here have in the room, so I don't need to talk about that, um, that ability. So to recap, you want me to recap or you, you want recap, to recap? Go for it. All right, well, I can recap. So digital markets acts, uh, it will make Apple bleed. I think this is your words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty violent. Uh, artificial intelligence begins to transform the ways of working. User acquisition recovers. Fair. App overtakes games and in-app purchases. Not looking at in-app ads. Not looking at web shop revenues. Investment crunch continues. So less investments coming in. And finally, the lean times drag on. Now, before we finish this up, before I welcome up a good chilling here, something that I haven't done for, for any of these events. We haven't taken a selfie on the stage and I really want to, so is it possible for me to take a selfie with Eric? <laughs> Would have you on the background? I'm, I'm too old. All right, I'm too come old on for here. Shit. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs>